Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? How about Palpatine the Hooded and Krusty? It's not a story the Jedi would tell you, it's a Sith legend, and it's one we just might learn a ton more about in the next Star Wars sequel. Join Screen Rant as we delve into the Star Wars franchise's past in order to predict the future. There are many unconfirmed rumors about Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, and perhaps the biggest reveal will revolve around Darth Sidious, aka Palpatine, and the fact that he's been hiding in plain sight. Let's theorize whether Snoke was actually Palpatine all along. In case you've been living under a rock or inside an asteroid with a giant space lug, The Expanded Universe is the series of novels, comic books, and short stories that told us what happened to our favorite Star Wars heroes before Disney bought the franchise. Then, Disney took over and wiped those tales from our memory banks. But that doesn't mean they don't exist in the Star Wars lexicon. Instead, these titles are now referred to as legends. And even though they're no longer canon, they still provide material and inspiration to the creative team at Lucasfilm, developing material for future movies, TV shows, video games, and probably some type of VR in the future. In the expanded universe, there were multiple storylines involving Palpatine's contingency plans in the event of his demise. It seemed like even after Darth Vader turned on his master in Return of the Jedi, our heroes would face a new major threat every year. And while it was probably an exhausting lifestyle for Luke, Han, and Leia, many of these conflicts likely provide us with clues for where the rise of Skywalker is heading, especially since many expanded universe stories entailed our heroes doing battle against some of the many backup plans Palpatine had in place. During the 1990s Dark Horse Comics miniseries Dark Empire, Palpatine reincarnated himself by transferring his consciousness into different clone bodies. To combat this, Luke turned to the dark side, or at least faked his turn to the dark side. While Dark Empire hasn't necessarily been a basis for many of the movies, the characters could quite possibly explore similar themes, with Palpatine being brought back from the dead thanks to his mobile consciousness, jumping into different bodies. Also, fans have theorized that Kylo Ren is either faking his turn to the dark side or using his dark side connections to realize more noble goals than Darth Sidious and the other Dark Lords before him. Whether any of these story elements come to fruition, it's important to remember that without a highly detailed map of the future in place from George Lucas, Palpatine, the big bad of the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, has a legacy that has always loomed high over Luke, Han, and Leia. When the sequel trilogy was announced and the storyline was revealed to be focused on the young apprentice Kylo Ren and his mysterious master, Supreme Leader Snoke, many fans believed the days of Darth Sidious were over. This all changed when the first trailer for Star Wars Episode IX, The Rise of Skywalker, was revealed, and its final moment showed off Sheev Palpatine's familiar cackle. <laughs> This was something new. The Star Wars films have shown us Jedi Knights resurrected in a ghostly form, but we've never seen any dark side users come back. And since old Shivi Palpatine got thrown into that shaft on the second Death Star, screaming in shock terror all the way down, we thought an entirely new threat would be the focal point of the overall arc shared by The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker. Sure. Palpatine is the Senate, but is he really immortal? Possibly, and perhaps he's been hiding in plain sight this whole time in the form of Snoke. Much like the now defunct expanded universe, Disney's version of the events between the movies also mentions a contingency plan that was once devised by Palpatine. It involved the unknown regions. We do know that it's the place where the rogue Imperial forces gathered following the Empire's defeat at the hands of the Rebel Alliance and after the formation of the New Republic. Under Disney's leadership, some of the Star Wars comic books and novels have gone into detail about the events that occurred between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, but much of the sequence of these events have been left murky. Even more casual fans didn't pick up on the politics that led to the formation of the Resistance, and many were probably confused over the dynamic between the Resistance, the New Republic, and the First Order. While that's great for the many audience members turned off by the convoluted storytelling and laborious pacing of Episodes 1, 2, and 3, it does mean it's not entirely clear exactly what's going on in this sequel trilogy. Was this all exactly how JJ and the team planned for the story to proceed when they first started working on The Force Awakens? Well, that's not entirely clear either, but ideally, the Lucasfilm crew will be able to answer all of our questions in this next film. 
So far, Chuck Wendig's trilogy of Aftermath books, which are in Disney's canon, have done more to fill us in on the events leading up to the sequel trilogy than, well, the sequel trilogy itself. Not only does Aftermath give us an idea of how the New Republic was demilitarized and, and how the seeds were planted for the Resistance to form, but we were also given a glimpse of Palpatine's plan in the event the Empire lost to the Rebel Alliance. Those Imperials who were still loyal to him were expected to go to the galaxy's unknown regions, following a winding and well-hidden path that was charted by the Emperor himself. There, they would rebuild their forces and plot their re-emergence, either by following plans left posthumously by the Emperor or by following the Emperor himself, whether he was revived by the dark side of the Force or he somehow survived the fall in the second Death Star. While there's always the chance that he Force projected himself during the Return of the Jedi through some complex form of Sith wizardry, it's more likely Snoke has been connected to old Palpy this whole time. As part of their big reveal of Palpatine at 2019 Star Wars Celebration, Lucas film head Kathleen Kennedy played it cool. She was quoted as saying, This has been in the blueprint for a long time. Yeah, we had not landed on exactly how we might do that, but yes, it was always to be in episode 9. A Redditor by the name of The Five Star Man was quick to respond to the Rise of Skywalker's Palpatine trailer reveal, theorizing that Snoke was merely a chosen successor by Darth Sidious. He was someone with an air of arrogance and leadership who could convince young Ben Solo to join the dark side and who had enough dark power in himself to serve as a figure head of the First Order. Then, once the galaxy was made ready for Palpatine's return, Darth Sidious could take his rightful place as the Emperor of the Galaxy. When Snoke had played his part in getting Ben Solo slash Kylo Ren to be fully susceptible to the dark side, Palpatine was perfectly fine with the young Padawan striking down Snoke. If this was all a part of Palpatine's plan, it's actually pretty similar to the way Palpatine reacted to Anakin killing off Count Dooku in Revenge of the Sith. Palpatine's cavalier attitude to the deaths of his most trusted acolytes actually fits with Palpatine's M.O. Yet Snoke wasn't just some random fool picked to serve as a puppet for Palpatine's whims. When we're introduced to him in The Force Awakens, the pruny, lanky villain instills fear in his underlings and he micromanages the actions of all of his troops from his covert locations. He maintains a tight grip over his forces in The Last Jedi, and that's why his death at the hands of Kylo Ren comes as such a surprise. We don't see it coming because the scene in Snoke's throne room has actually played out much like the throne room sequence in Return of the Jedi. Snoke appears to be aware of each of his enemies' movements, and every character seems powerless to stop him, until Kylo Ren turns on Snoke and kills him. Much like how young Palpatine turned on his own master, Darth Plagueis the Wise, when Plagueis least expected it. The demise of Snoke is actually the perfect turning point for Kylo Ren's total and complete shift to the dark side. Up until this point in The Last Jedi, Kylo and Rey's storylines appear to be going in one of two directions. Either he's gonna join her and return to the Resistance, or she's gonna join him, they'll both reject the Jedi and the Sith, and they'll start something new. Instead, Kylo decides to turn his lightsaber on Snoke and embraces a full-time, all-benefits-paid leadership position with the First Order. If Snoke was acting in his own best interest, this is the last thing the Supreme Leader would want to happen. And since Snoke seems to be able to foresee everything else that occurs in the movie before this moment, it's a bit of a surprise that the Supreme Leader could be taken out by Kylo Ren so easily, especially since Kylo Ren has been such a screw-up until now. Therefore, it only makes sense for Snoke's demise to be a part of the Emperor's ultimate plan. And if Snoke was in cahoots with the Emperor this whole time, then maybe it was a part of Snoke's plan as well. Another online theory suggests that Snoke may have been a Force projection, just like Luke's projection on Krayt in the climax of The Last Jedi. Snoke is a man of mystery. We haven't met his exact species before, we never heard of him before The Force Awakens, and he appears to have been connected to Luke, Han, and Leia, and galactic politics before revealing himself as the nefarious leader of the First Order. The Supreme Leader bears the scars of brutal injuries, and still seems quite powerful, before Kylo sliced him in half. With so little known about him or his backstory, it makes the most dramatic sense for him to be either a projection of Palpatine or a servant who's given his entire life to Palpatine's cause. Sure, it sounds like a very Voldemort thing for Star Wars to do, but since J.K. Rowling appeared to borrow certain story elements from George Lucas, it seems only fair that Lucasfilm returned the favor. And as Voldemort haunts Harry Potter for a decent chunk of the book series in spirit form, his essence stored inside Horcruxes, Sith apparently had a similar skill. In the Darth Vader comic series, the spirit of a Sith named Momin is still attached to his helmet. 
With Darth Vader's helmet still in Kylo Ren's possession, it's quite possible that one or two Sith Lords have attached themselves to this as well. And with Sith Stormtroopers making their debut in this film as well, it seems as if everything is proceeding according to the Emperor's plan. Either way, we'll all be proven right or wrong when the curtains rise on the rise of Skywalker, and we just have to let the film show us their interpretation and let the fans and naysayers duke it out like a Jedi versus Sith battle in the comments section, as the Emperor would say, so be it, Jedi. Do you truly, deeply love this theory about how a Naboo Senator loves a Chosen One? Or do you want to strike this theory down with all of your hatred so your journey to the dark side will be complete? Let us know in the comments section. Oh, and keep us posted on any other theories you may have about this story from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. With the Mandalorian and future films from popular filmmakers, we'll be endlessly debating theories the way the Galactic Senate endlessly debates the taxation of trade routes. See you next time, and may the Force be with you.